Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy on EWTN. We hope you're having a great new year. Now, let's continue with our discussion we began at the beginning of this year about the seven deadly sins and the corresponding virtues to overcome them. Today, we talk about anger. But it may be confusing because in the Bible, Jesus seems to first condemn anger, but then he appears to get angry himself. So how do we explain this? On the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus compares the punishment for anger with that of murderers. He said, you have heard it said, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Yet in Jerusalem, Jesus seems later to be quite angry at the Pharisees, saying, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Wow, so what are we to make of this apparent contradiction? Well, the answer is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 1767 tells us that as a passion, anger itself is neither good nor evil, surprisingly. Then in paragraph 2302, it says that anger can even be noble if it is directed toward maintaining justice and correcting vice. It can be a passionate desire to set things right in the face of evil. Um, noble anger is not about getting even with a person, but about protecting one's own good, the good of the community, and even the good of the person who hurt us. You know, this seems to be the kind of anger Jesus has against the Pharisees. Out of great love for them, he warns them of the deadly path that they are on if they keep rejecting him. And this is why St. Paul says that anger itself can be virtuous and not necessarily sinful. He says in Ephesians 4, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Remember, when Jesus flipped the tables in the temple, he wasn't angry that people were selling animals for sacrifice. That was part of the Jewish faith. It was because the money changers were cheating the people. So being angry about the right things and in the right way, he had to get their attention, is actually virtuous, as we said. You know, that is what I tell my staff uh, when I get upset over something, but I'm not sure that they always buy it. So St. Thomas Aquinas elaborates some more on this. He goes so far as to say that it is a vice not to get angry over things that we should. That's surprising. Uh, he calls it unreasonable patience. For instance, failure to correct the wicked encourages them to persist in their evil ways, since there are no consequences for them. It also causes confusion over what is right and what is wrong, leading people astray. So remember, it is a work of mercy to admonish the sinner. One example is abortion. The taking of an innocent life is one of the greatest injustices. We should be angry about this and demand our laws be changed. It is not reasonable to be patient in such matters because lives are at stake every day. An unreasonable patience uh, can also take place right in your own home. That's right, extreme anger obviously is never justified, but the failure to discipline your child can also be problematic. 
Uh, since righteous anger seeks to set things right in the face of evil, it can be very good if it is grounded in love for the person who has done wrong. And this is why parents should correct their children when they are misbehaving. Of course, we're not talking about severe punishment flowing out of rage, but out of love. Children need some form of discipline because failure to correct their vices now will have serious consequences in the future. They will be disappointed later when they come to realize that the world does not revolve around them. But while being angry over the right things is justified, we also want to avoid the many ways that anger can be and is sinful. St. Thomas Aquinas again tells us that anger also can be this sinful um, part of our lives if we're not careful. First, when we are angry over especially the wrong things, things that are not unjust. For example, a lazy student who did not study but is angry at his teacher for giving him a poor grade or a family member who is angry at you for not coming home for Thanksgiving dinner even though you are very sick. Uh, another way uh, that we might fall into sinful anger is in our motives. When someone hurts us or upsets us, we might become vindictive, wanting to see that person suffer for it and to get what they deserve. Instead, the virtuous man cares for their soul, hoping that those who do evil will repent and do good. Uh, another way that anger can be sinful is if it is too fierce. This can happen even surprisingly without saying or doing anything. Yes, we can be malicious, uh, malicious just in our thoughts like holding a grudge or secretly wishing uh, some person harm. Worse, anger can also become manifest in the way we speak or act towards another person, especially when they've upset us. So it is and can be a capital sin when it gives birth to the other vices in leading us to more sinful thoughts, words, or actions against someone, as we've said. You know, this seems to be the kind of anger Jesus condemned in the Sermon on the Mount, not the virtuous anger that seeks the rehabilitation of an evildoer like he showed with the Pharisees. So the Catechism states that anger as a deadly sin is defined as a disorderly outburst of emotion connected with the inordinate desire for revenge. If anger reaches the point of a deliberate desire to harm someone, either physically, emotionally, or spiritually, it is grave. And since it's against charity, it can be and usually is a mortal sin if it's extreme. Uh, note that this is different, though, from the feeling of anger, which is not sinful in itself. Why? Because we can't control when we feel a certain way, like feeling angry, because that depends on events that occur outside of us. But what we can control is how we react to it, either handling it rationally or irrationally, such as by being passive-aggressive. This means that you don't show anger directly at someone, but rather indirectly through things like slight insults uh, or silent, the silent treatment. We've all had that and we've probably done it at one time or another, or doing something only because we know it will irritate the person. You might know what I'm referring to here. Another dysfunctional expression of anger is bringing up the past, bringing up the sins of others, never forgetting. But don't you forget, if we want God to forgive our past, we have to do the same with others. How then uh, do we respond when bad things happen to us by other people or because of others? 
patience. Patience is a virtue. You've all heard this. Yes, patience is the virtue we need to help us bear difficulties and trials. According to St. Thomas Aquinas again, patience preserves peace of mind in the face of injury, suffering, and sadness, which we all face. It prevents us from being discouraged and affords us great freedom. That's because the patient man is free. He stays on course even when bad things happen because he isn't controlled or run by the, the need for revenge. So the person lacking in patience is so overcome by his own troubles that he fails to live virtuously in his relationships with others. We should strive not to be closed in on our own problems. It may seem impossible to remain cheerful and focused on others during times of our own trials, but remember, with God, all things are possible. Patience goes hand in hand with the virtue of perseverance because it enables us to persist firmly against all difficulties and not fall into sinful anger. There are a few people I know that have never been angry, but again, you have to have that balance, keeping justice and proper patience and perseverance. So to finish, if you don't believe that this is possible, that you really don't have to get angry, try going to confession more often. There, you are not only given forgiveness of past sins, uh, for instance, of anger, but you'll receive the grace to help you avoid the sin of anger in the future. What a grace. Now, let's hear the story of Nancy Salerno as she discusses quite an amazing spiritual journey. She didn't want children. Then something happened which could have caused many people to be angry with God. Instead, it ended up being a tremendous gift in the person by the name of Nick. As a young adult, Nancy Jean Nightcherill thought she had her career and her life all planned out. Her goal would be to work in foreign relations for the United Nations. Being married and having a family wasn't even a thought. I was a very selfish person in some ways. Um, I thought children were a nuisance. But in 1987, Nancy met a bright, sensitive young man named Mark Salerno. They were married in the fall of 1989. He wanted to have a family, and I thought, okay, well, maybe one perfect child would be okay. Six was fine with me, uh, so uh, we just decided let's start with one. So um, we were overjoyed and uh, ready to start our family. So in the winter of 1996, Nicholas James Salerno was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. It was an exciting time. I mean, we just had a new child and about as excited as you could be. I really thought everything was going to be great once we had Nicholas and, um, you know, we're living the perfect life, I thought, um, you know, far from it. In August of 1996, during Nicholas's six-month checkup, the Salernos were given a devastating diagnosis about their son. The pediatrician looked at me flatly and said, your baby has cerebral palsy. Well, I was angry at God. I was angry. I'm not going to lie. How could he have done this? How could he have allowed this to happen? And I didn't go into any depression or any long lengths of sadness. We just wanted to give him whatever we could give him because he fought so hard to be in this world. We knew he was a survivor, and we knew by looking at him, you can see his joy of being alive. You never know what's gonna happen in your life, what path you're gonna be led down. You just have to be willing to you know, take that path. Having a child with cerebral palsy didn't prevent Mark and Nancy from expanding their family. They were providing a loving home, but they wanted Nick to experience life with siblings. We gave him a family because we wanted him to be surrounded by love. So this woman who didn't wanna have children had three others. And we just exposed him to whatever we could to give him the best life possible. The Salerno family unit was in place, but for Nancy, 
she was still terribly distraught about being a special needs mom. One day, God led her to a place where she began the journey to find her faith again. I'd never seen Our Lady in this pose before, and immediately I felt drawn to it. I saw myself in her, and it is of Our Lady sitting on a rock with her head in her hands, and she's crying. And right then and there, I saw myself, that's the pose I've been in, and weeping for my child. A short time later, in the middle of Nick's bathroom floor, God revealed to her that Nick's story is not one of drudgery or despair, but of opportunity and fulfillment. And as I'm kneeling on the floor and I'm taking off his braces, I'm feeling this ray of light come down. It felt like it was a warm ray of light. I just, I just could just feel it. And I was holding his feet and I just heard the feet of Jesus, the feet of Jesus. You are the caretaker of Jesus' messenger. Nancy's awakening helped her to finally understand her purpose, to help Nick live his life to the fullest, faith included. Nick's favorite time to spend with our Lord is just right in front of the crucifix where he has his conversations. And nothing brings more joy to Nick than seeing our Lord. The crucifix is so important to him. So many people are struggling and suffering in their lives. My God, I am sorry for my sins with all my heart. But seeing someone like Nick carrying his cross daily and being faithful to Jesus, that's an inspiration for, for my own faith, personal faith. During Easter of 2014, the Salerno's home parish asked Nick to portray the part of Jesus in their annual depiction of the Stations of the Cross. Often people who suffer the most are given the gift of having deeper reliance on God and a deeper spiritual life. They know that to love is to be willing to sacrifice and to do anything for the good of the other. To watch grown men with muscles screaming, spitting, I think it brings home the sacrifice that Christ made for all of us, for the world. For me, of course, I'm always thinking about the symbolism behind it, but, you know, Christ, as St. Paul said, became sin. And that is, he took on all of our human deficiencies and sorrows in order to teach us that the image of God is in each and every person. And yeah, it was very moving. Good morning, sweetheart. Looks like you're pretty happy to get up today. Caring for Nick today is a challenge. The routine of critical daily care for the Salernos is anything but normal. Nick requires care incomprehensible to most parents, but Mark and Nancy wouldn't change a thing about caring for their son, who they love so much. I look at it as being a father, and so there isn't any other option. I'm going to do it. So no matter how tough times are, then that you know, it still needs to be done. And I have a saying on board for Nick, it's like, if you're not tired, I'm not tired. And he's the hardest working person I've ever met. Nick has refused to allow his disabilities to define him. He has proven his resilience and perseverance by excelling in a public grade school and college environment. Nick has received A's in almost every subject. He's taken physics and astronomy and all kinds of math, algebra, history. He's taken really tough classes. Nick has also been successful in athletic endeavors he participates in. His various awards line the walls in his home and show accomplishments including various 5K, 10K, and full triathlon events. Most recently, he completed an Ironman. Just watching the spectators on a side watch when Nick went by on his bike or when they were during a run or you know even during a swim you could hear people cheering like how how unbelievable this is so it was it was an unbelievable experience Nick has taught me what's important in life and it makes me try to be a better person it makes me try to do the best I can every day so it makes me never want to give up on anything it's been the greatest blessing of my life 
to be Nick's mom and the mother of his siblings. His birth has brought me closer to Jesus in so many ways and closer to the Blessed Mother. I look at Nicholas as a gift and it's a challenge, but I always thought that we were going to be teaching Nicholas and Nick's been teaching us. I get to be the caretaker of God's messenger on this earth. It is a great privilege. It is a great joy. It is my life's purpose. Wow, Nancy, what an example of true love. You know, I have always said that I don't even have to know the parents personally of a special needs child to know how special they are themselves. That is because God never would have entrusted you with such a special gift like Nick had he known that you wouldn't embrace it. God bless you and bless Nick. Now, let's go to some of our pilgrims who come here on Eden Hill, and as they tell us what they understand about anger. So one of the seven would be anger. And one of the things I feel like is helpful in that, first of all, prayer. And when you're tempted to feel that way it is to do the opposite of what you initially want to do. Um, maybe say something uncharitable, is to just uh, do the opposite of that and be patient and kind. Oftentimes I feel we deserve oftentimes we're put I feel like God puts us in positions to practice that. So if you do or if you are tempted to anger, it's probably because you have to work on that. And God puts that in your in your life and uh, you just have to try your best. Now let's go back to Father Anthony as he tells us a little bit more about the need for patience. Hi, I'm Father Anthony Gramlich for the Marians of the Immaculate Conception. Many people will ask, how do I become more patient? Well, patience is part of fortitude. It's to help us to endure sufferings in life, inconveniences in life. It's to help us to overcome obstacles. Patience is one of those virtues that if, if we ask for patience, don't be surprised that you may be put in a situation to to exercise patience. So I'm thinking of, you know, you ask for patience and then all of a sudden you're in a traffic jam and you got all these cars going slow and so you have to display patience at that moment. And we need to ask the good Lord for that gift of patience to help us to overcome ourselves, to overcome impatience, to overcome complaining about certain things and to ask the, the good Lord to help us to be patient, to be meek, not to murmur, not to complain, but to accept every suffering that the good Lord sends us for our purification and sanctification. So don't be surprised if the next time you ask for patience, you may be stuck in traffic, you may have someone annoy you, but that's the Lord who's trying to bring out that virtue in our lives. Likewise, my brethren, you have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. St. Paul sums up the human predicament by saying, I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. We generally want to do what we know is right and good, but our fears, passions, impatience, and self-centeredness all too often seem to grip us and get in the way. We can try to blame our moral failures on others, but we are responsible for our own faults in the end. St. Paul does not despair in the face of human failures, because he sees them in the light of God's mercy. We do not have to earn God's transforming love. Instead, we need to welcome it. 
with open, penitent, and faithful hearts. This divine gift of grace, though freely offered, will cost us dearly to receive. Only a heart willing to let go of its selfish delusions and stubborn pride will have room for the Lord to enter. The transformation of our hearts requires deep repentance and purifying penance on our part, but the result is well worth the cost. In the end, we can say with St. Paul, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Soon afterwards, I became ill. Physical weakness was for me a school of patience. Only Jesus knows how many efforts of will I had to make to fulfill my duty. Once, when I saw how much my confessor, probably Father Sopochko, was to suffer because of this work, which God was going to carry out through him, fear seized me for the moment, and I said to the Lord, Jesus, this is your affair, so why are you acting this way toward him? It seems to me that you are making difficulties for him, while at the same time ordering him to act. Write that, by day and by night, my gaze is fixed upon him, and I permit these adversities in order to increase his merit. I do not reward for good results, but for the patience and hardship undergone for my sake. Well, thank you everybody for joining us this week on understanding anger and how to overcome it with patience. And join us next week as we continue our discussions on the seven deadly sins, where we'll talk about greed and how to overcome that of the seven deadly sins. So until then, may Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.